This lecture is going to give you an introduction to the nervous system. Here's a list of our learning objectives. And I fully understand that this is huge, but this, um, this is all the stuff that we get to cover in this course. So this first part is just a basic introduction to some of the cells of the nervous system. So starting with the um, two major categories of cells. We have neuroglia. which are the supporting cells. And then we have neurons, which are the conductive cells. So neurons are going to conduct the uh, nerve impulses. Well, neuroglia are just the supporting cells that help support the function of the nervous system. So the two cells that we see here, first we have an astrocyte. An astrocyte protects the blood-brain barrier. We are very picky at what is allowed to pass from our bloodstream into our brain. There are tons of toxins that are constantly circulating around in our bloodstream, and we don't want those toxins getting into our brain. Unfortunately, some have the capability of interacting with that blood-brain barrier and causing changes in our brain. And this is why we end up with fevers when we get certain infections. But astrocytes are going to be cells that surround the blood vessels that feed into the central nervous system, and they are going to protect and kind of super regulate the materials that transfer from the center or the lumen of the blood vessel into the brain tissue. We call them astrocytes because they look like kind of star-shaped cells. The next type of cell is a microglia cell. A microglia cell is the immune cell of the central nervous system. Now with microglial cells, they're going to be major phagocytes. And a phagocyte is any cell that's going to eat organisms. So um, predominantly going to eat like bacterial organisms that come in and cause infection. So microglia cells, they are the immune cells of your central nervous system. The next cell is an epidemal cell. This cell makes and circulates cerebral spinal fluid, abbreviated CSF. And you can see these cells have cilia on the top of them, and that helps circulate the cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid is rich in nutrients, and we're going to learn more about that once we get to that section in this, this lecture today. Oligodendrocytes make up the myelin sheath. In the central nervous system. And when they make up this myelin sheath, they're going to protect the um, kind of insulate and electrically protect these uh, neurons so that nerve impulses can be transmitted quickly. And we'll talk a little bit about how the nerve impulse is generated, but basically ions go in, ions go out, and if the ions were not electrically insulated, they could just float away freely. It also allows for rapid um, jumps between these different nodes, so from node to node this electrical impulse can jump pretty quickly. If these oligodendrocytes get damaged, nerve impulse is slow, and that leads to things like multiple sclerosis. So if you've heard of MS before, multiple sclerosis, that's the damage or deterioration of these oligodendrocytes, which leads to slowed nerve impulses. So oligodendrocytes make up the myelin sheath of the central nervous system. The next one we have here is a Schwann cell. And a Schwann cell makes up the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. This, this um, Schwann cell kind of wraps around the nerve, and that's going to, again, electrically insulate and protect that axon of the ner neuron. Satellite cells support the cell bodies of neurons in the peripheral nervous system. 
So both of these cells are found in the peripheral nervous system, while the other four we talked about are found in the central nervous system. Now why are these so important? Well, you have one neuron that spans from your spinal cord all the way to the tip of your toe. If you can imagine how long that is, that's super long for one cell. That cell can get damaged at any place along the length and that can regenerate. So at any point along that long axon, it can be damaged. But if the cell body is damaged, that entire neuron's dead. So we have these extra special satellite cells that are gonna surround the cell bodies of peripheral neurons and that makes sure that they are um, insulated and extra protected. And now we finally get to a neuron. So this is what a neuron is. And there are several parts that you guys have to know. The dendrites are the receptive regions. So these are the dendrites. They contain receptors and they receive signals. The cell body is here and that contains all of the major organelles of the neuron. Right here is the axon hillock. The axon hillock is where the signal accumulates. And that signal accumulating, we're gonna talk more about that in just a little bit, but here we have the signal accumulating. Then we have the axon. And the axon is the region that conducts a nerve impulse. Surrounding the axon, we have Schwann cells. And then of the Schwann cell, we have these neurolemma. A neurolemma is a bulge of cytoplasm and organelles of a Schwann cell. If we go back to the picture of the Schwann cell, the Schwann cell literally wraps itself around the axon of a neuron. Now when it wraps itself around, it's tightly coiled, but at the end, all of this stuff is left over and all of that bulging cytoplasm is called the neurolemma of that um, Schwann cell. Imagine taking an egg, cracking it open in a frying pan and um, frying it up, sunny side up. Now imagine taking that sunny side up egg and try to wrap it around a pencil. It's kind of what happens, so if you wrap it around here that's going to be all nice and tight but then the nucleus is going to bulge out and um, so like the yolk of that egg is going to bulge out that's what the neurolemma really is and then we have the nodes of ranvier nodes of ranvier are spaces between schwann cells and then we have these axon terminals and axon terminals are going to secrete neurotransmitters when signaled so when the signal is received here, it accumulates here, and then eventually it'll reach a threshold and then the nerve impulse will get triggered to fire. And then once the nerve impulse gets to the end here where you have these axon terminals, then calcium will enter in and that will lead to the release of the neurotransmitters from the end of the neuron. So what is a neurotransmitter? A neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger. And that chemical messenger will bind to a specific receptor on a cell and cause a change in that cell. If we talk about the neurotransmitter um, binding in this typical scenario here, we have a neurotransmitter that will pass through a synapse and then bind to receptors on the dendrites. As soon as it binds to receptors on the dendrites, it's going to cause the opening of a particular type of channel. So a doorway in the neuron is gonna open. This doorway is specific for sodium. Now try to think way back toward the end of the semester when we talked about the intracellular and extracellular cations and anions. We said that a predominant of sodium and chloride ions are on the outside in the extracellular environment and predominantly potassium and these negatively charged proteins and phosphate are going to be found on the inside. So we set the stage for a nerve impulse. As soon as a neurotransmitter binds it opens a door 
and sodium starts flooding into the inside of this neuron. Now sodium is going to move in here kind of like waves. Imagine that this is a large lake and right here we have a boat. And this is an imaginary boat sitting here. It's not an actual boat. Um, but imagine that we are trying to tip this boat over by throwing rocks into the lake here. Now every time we throw a rock, we're going to cause a, a ripple effect in the water. And that's going to cause waves to form. And the boat's going to start to rock. But the more and more neurotransmitters that bind, the more sodium is going to flood into the inside of this neuron. And it's going to accumulate a charge. And once that charge accumulates and that charge reaches a threshold at this point of the axon hillock, also known as the summation zone, it's going to trigger voltage-gated sodium channels to open. And then we're going to have an all or nothing response all the way to the end. Imagine this boat tipping over. Well, if you were sitting in that boat, you're going to have to swim all the way to the end or you're going to die. So it's all or nothing with this nerve impulse. So slow and steady at one rate all the way down to the end. The more neurotransmitters bind, the more likely we are to reach threshold and to stimulate that nerve impulse to fire. But once the nerve impulse does fire, we can't stop it. It's going to go. So I said that this is slow and steady all the way to the end, and it's at one intensity. So how does our brain tell the difference between us getting a paper cut and us getting our arm blown off? <laughs> well, if your arm was suddenly blown off, you wouldn't just have one or two neurotransmitters signaling the absence of your arm. You would have millions. And those millions of neurotransmitters would overcome this um, kind of resetting phase called hyperpolarization, which if you go on to take advanced AMP, you're going to learn more about the details of that. But it's going to be enough to overcome that, and you're going to have numerous nerve impulses firing down this axon. And then the brain interprets that information. If one or two impulses go down the axon, then it's probably a paper cut. But if you're having thousands and thousands of these signals going down this axon, then the brain knows that something major happened and that this needs to um, take primary focus. So that's kind of what happens during the nerve impulse. The input zone is talking about the dendrites and cell body. Those are going to receive the signals because there's specialized receptors there that can bind to neurotransmitters. The summation zone is talking about the axon hillock, and that's where that signal accumulates. In other words, as these doors open, more sodium is going to rush into the inside, and that's going to increase the voltage on the inside of the neuron. And once we increase it to a certain number, it's going to cause this nerve impulse to fire. Then we have the conduction zone, and the conduction zone is talking about the axon. That's where the actual nerve impulse happens. Like a domino effect, sodium channels are going to open, and sodium is going to enter. Then potassium channels are going to open, and potassium is going to leave. And then more potassium channels are going to open, and more potassium is going to leave. And then we enter into this hyperpolarization state that has to be reset eventually. But once our signal gets down to the output zone, the axon terminals, neurotransmitters are released from these synaptic knobs. So calcium is going to enter into the axon terminals, and that combines with this thing called synaptotagmin, which combines with the vesicles that are containing neurotransmitters and stimulates exocytosis, so the release of the neurotransmitters. Once these neurotransmitters are released from the end of the axon here, they're going to go on to signal the next neuron.